Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I particularly want to thank, of course, Dr. Dhanuraj uh, and CPPR, uh, particularly the Centre for Strategic Studies for giving me this chance to, to come and speak here. Thanks also to the Consulate General of, uh, uh, of Japan in Chennai, uh, which has helped make uh, this entire event possible. Uh, I just learned that uh, Japan has three or four consulate generals in, uh, in India, plus the embassy in Delhi, which is quite a big diplomatic presence. But uh, as, the, um, as the, uh, uh, our guest from Japan said, India is a very big country, so they need a lot of diplomats here. Um, I uh, also want to thank uh, my old friend, uh, Lawrence Prabhakar, who uh, got me involved in this. And, uh, you know, we've been uh, friends for a long time and, and of course, academic uh, uh, collaborators as well. Um, if I could, on a very personal note, I also want to just recognize uh, a very old school friend of mine who uh, somehow tracked me down here, uh, George Verghees. Uh, I've only known him since 1966 when I came back as an 11-year-old from England, uh, and we were in the same school together at St. Xavier's in Delhi, so it's lovely to see George here, and uh, particular, uh, particular thanks, in a sense, for CPPR to allow him to attend this and renew our friendship. Um, before I begin, I just want to say a couple of other things. Uh, first of all, my own uh, area is mostly strategic thinking, uh, and so this is going to be really a strategic analysis. I know in the days ahead, in the two days ahead, uh, there are many sessions on a much wider sense of what India and Japan uh, can do together, areas of cooperation, opportunities, and threats for them, uh, economic issues relating to connectivity, perhaps even multilateral collaboration. But my focus really is to look at the kind of strategic choices ahead of Japan uh, and India. And so uh, please bear with me. I mean, I think those choices uh, will condition so much of what India and Japan do. Uh, but of course, I can't uh, cover the gamut of things that uh, India and Japan uh, might be partners in, in the 21st century. And of course, um, uh, nor am I going to do a lot on exactly what um, the two countries should do. It's not primarily a talk that's very prescriptive. I think India and Japan are already doing a number of things that I think they should properly be doing. So I suppose my broader message is that uh, they're doing about the right and appropriate things. Uh, they could deepen things ahead. And the very long-term prospect is that they could have a much deeper perhaps even strategic alliance together, but that's quite a long time in the future, it seems to me. And, and I'll try and show why, and I hope you'll bear with me uh, as I try and demonstrate that uh, in some detail. We, we, we meet here to discuss the possibility of India and Japan as partners in the shadow of three global changes. The first is the astonishing rise of China, which may be the most salient development for India and Japan. The second is the reaction against globalization in the West, and particularly the United States. That reaction has produced Donald Trump as president and a new approach to US foreign policy, uh, whatever one might think of that approach. In fact, that approach has been marked over the past year or so, almost two years now, by an economic conflict between America and China and a go-it-alone strategy. The third development is related uh, and it is Trump's impatience with the US's traditional allies in Europe and Asia, including in some measure uh, Japan, at least in the early days of Trump's uh, ascension to power. India, which was trying to close, trying to forge a closer relationship with the US, has also felt the sting of Trump's foreign policy. It's in this strategic environment that we gather to assess India-Japan cooperation. I'm not going to chart China's rise or US foreign policy under Trump. There's enough writing on all those subjects to fill several rooms, if not uh, several hotel rooms, hotels. I want to focus instead on India-Japan relations, which is the theme of this conference. Clearly, the coming together of these two countries is driven by several factors, including the economic interests of both. But beyond economic are the strategic drivers of their cooperation. Here, China's rise and the US's erratic behavior and possible retrenchment from Asian alliances are key. 
I won't attempt to show that these are the drivers of India-Japan's strategic convergence. I simply assert them as they seem too obvious really to justify in front of an audience such as this. I will instead attempt an, an analysis of the strategic choices for India and Japan in the context of China's rise and the US's behavior. And I want to begin by sketching in some highlights of India-Japan relations since the early 20th century, essentially to make the point that they've never really been enemies or real close friends. I think a point that perhaps Dhanuraj made uh, quite astutely in his opening remarks. I will then go on to assess the strategic choices before India and Japan in dealing with a rising China at a time when the US, the reigning superpower, as I said, seems erratic and unreliable. Essentially, the choices for India and Japan are to bandwagon, hide, hedge, or balance. And I'll say more about all these terms. I think the word balance is pretty clear to everyone. But uh, nonetheless, I'll try and flesh out the other terms in, in a bit. My analysis of these options suggests that bandwagoning, hiding, and hedging are not politically and strategically viable. Among India and Japan's balancing options, and balancing itself can be unpacked, as international relations scholars do unpack them, into internal balance, external balance, and a rather new term, soft balancing. And I argue that soft balancing is the most viable for the foreseeable future. Complicating strateg uh, China's strategic calculations, which is the essence of soft balancing, is a sensible course. Outright confrontation with China is not. This is strategic common sense, but sometimes the case for strategic common sense needs to be explicitly made. So I begin with a little recent history, that is to say, from about the 20th century. It's fair to say that India and Japan have not been terribly close historically. Indeed, India and China, over thousands of years, have been closer, geographically, spiritually, economically. The two were even allies during the Second World War against Japan. Rabindranath Tagore's interest in Japan and his trip there in 1916 remind us there was promise of great cultural traffic between India and Japan. But Tagore was dismayed at the time, uh, remarking on the rising militarism uh, that he saw. In his famous three essays on nationalism, he worried about Western and Japanese, and indeed, some of the emerging shape of Indian nationalism as well. During the Second World War, Indian and Japanese troops uh, fought each other. After the war, India expressed its discomfort with the war trials of Japanese officials and officers. Radha Binod Pal, the famous Indian jurist uh, and the Indian judge on the War Crimes Tribunal, famously wrote the dissenting note to the tribunals arguing against Japanese war crime punishments. By 1960, Japan, which had hoped that India might be a force for stability and development in Asia, had decided that New Delhi was neither ge geopolitically nor economically aligned with Japanese interests. In turn, Nehruvian India had decided that Japan was not an independent power, at least in international affairs. It is fair to say that India and Japan remain apart more or less for the remainder of the Cold War, the next 30 years or so. After the US rapprochement with China in 1972, Tokyo, you'll remember, engineered its own rapprochement with Beijing. Geopolitically and economically, the two East Asian powers had parallel interests. Geopolitically, they lined up against the Soviet Union, India's quasi-ally, and economically, they dramatically opened up uh, to an economic partnership featuring uh, aid, investment, and trade, with Japan in the lead. This was at a time when India's economy had stayed stubbornly closed. In sum, from 1972 onwards, China and Japan came to be on the opposite side of the Cold War from India, which tilted towards the Soviet Union. The conclusion we can draw from the above is that India and Japan do not have a deep history of cooperation and closeness in the modern period. As a quick aside, 
they do have one modern instance of strategic partnership, if it can be called that. And that is, of course, Subhash Chandra Bose working with the Japanese to fight British colonial rule in India. That strategic story, I think, is much more uh, in the news in India now, especially under the Modi government. But it's not a chapter that Japan would want to highlight. It is not, therefore, a memory on which to build a strategic partnership, I would argue. India and Japan did come together in one very important sense after the Second World War. In 1958, Japanese aid began to flow to India for the first time. Despite the fact that Tokyo did not see trade and commercial opportunities in India at the time, because of our closed economy, it did become one of India's biggest uh, aid providers. And by the la late 1980s, Japan had become India's uh, single largest aid donor, a position it's retained to the present day. Since the 1980s, India and Japan have come some way, particularly economically, and I think Dhanur shared some of those facts and figures, so I'll just skip them. Diplomatic and strategically, too, the two sides know each other much better than ever before. And this is a point that I'll, of course, return to later. Now, of course, this is a rather sketchy history uh, or review of India-Japan relations from the 20th century. And my friends, such as Prabhakar from JNU and others, will, will, uh, will know much more and, of course, can fill in the details. But I think I, I intend it really to give us a sense that while India and Japan have never been enemies, as I said, they've never been quite close friends or deep partners. This doesn't mean that they cannot be close in the future. It just means that they don't know each other very well, either out of hostility, that's one way you get to know another uh, society, or out of friendship, which is the other way. Well, this brings me then to the, the heart of my talk, which is really on unpacking these four strategic options in, uh, that, that India and Ch uh, Japan have uh, in, in thinking about how to deal with China primarily. The most important reason for India and Japan to come together is the rise of China. While they resist saying so publicly, this is the elephant in the room. The question is, what are the options in dealing with the China that will probably be the biggest power on Earth by 2030? Eventually, China may account for 40% of global GDP. I mean, it's always tricky to make these kinds of extrapolations, and we know uh, there are all kinds of, of uh, byways that they may be knocked into, the Chinese, along the way. But uh, uh, people like uh, Nobel laureate Robert Fogel have predicted about a 40% uh, they would have about 40% of global GDP eventually. And if so, China would be bigger than the next set of powers combined economically. That is the United States, India, and several other big powers. This means that China would be an international behemoth as the United States was after the Second World War. This is a scary future for India and Japan, both of whom are neighbors of China. I mean, one could say that there are opportunities here too, obviously, in such a massive economy. But I think one must also look in the eye coldly the fact that uh, great economic power also means great strategic challenge for China's neighbors. Both uh, India and Japan have unresolved territorial quarrels and a history of conflict and rivalry in the modern period with, with China. What then are their options? As I said, I see four drawing on international relations scholarship and a good dose of common sense, I think. And these are bandwagoning, hiding, hedging, and balancing. So let me deal with bandwagoning first. The first option is for both countries to bandwagon with China, to go along with Beijing as junior partners and to receive protection in return. Now, ho however much we may not like that option, theoretically, this is an option for, us, for smaller powers. What would this mean? This would mean accepting Chinese leadership on global and regional issues. Most importantly, it would mean accepting its assertions on territorial conflicts, the border and perhaps Arunachal Pradesh in India's case, and the Senkaku Daiwu Islands in Japan's case. Globally, India and Japan would be expected to curtail their relations with the US. In Japan's case, this would mean leaving the alliance. Regionally, they would have to accept that East Asia and South Asia are Chinese spheres of influence. In return for going along with Beijing, New Delhi and Tokyo would get protection 
principally from China itself. They would also, presumably, get to be a part of a huge Sinic economic zone. Clearly, though, bandwagoning is a theoretic possibility and no more. India has never been part of the Sinic regional order and has never been a tributary. Some parts of India sent a tributary mission to China historically, but no pan-Indian empire, as far as we know, ever conceded superiority to China. Chinese cultural influences also were limited, though obviously not altogether absent. I think if you're in Kochi, there are of course the famous Chinese fishing nets, which are just a reminder of uh, Chinese influence. The Indian view generally is that India gave more than it received culturally, primarily in the form of Buddhism. Japan was geopolitically and culturally part of a Sinic order, though by the 7th century it had started to move away from China. In the 16th century, it even tried to take over the Middle Kingdom's hegemonic role when it mounted an invasion of Korea as a prelude to invading China. The invasion failed, as we know. Unlike Korea and Vietnam, Japan was never conquered by China. From the late 19th century and into the Second World War, it harbored ambitions of colonizing China, or at least parts of China. Today, neither Indian nor Japanese public opinion would tolerate bowing before China. Both peoples have too strong a sense of their own importance politically and culturally, and strong feelings of nationalism. Bandwagoning with China, in short, is not impossible, but it seems a very unlikely future. There are at least two other conciliatory stances that India and Japan could take with China, hiding and hedging. And again, I think we have to look these two coldly in the eye to assess their plausibility. The historian of Europe's international history, Paul Schroeder, who was a professor at my old university, the University of Illinois, has suggested that contrary to Europe operated a balance of power system in which small powers basically had only two choices. They either bandwagoned or they balanced against the big powers. Schroeder shows that they had, in fact, other choices. These included what he calls hiding. Hiding refers to staying out of the gun sights of bigger powers. It amounts to a kind of neutralism in which staying out of the gun sights of the more powerful includes not taking sides between them. Hiding is a conciliatory stance that falls short of bandwagoning, but for India and Japan, it would mean conceding to China. In China's quarrels with the US and perhaps other Western powers, it would mean that New Delhi and Tokyo would take a Swiss-like position of abstention. For Japan, more than India, it would, it would almost be a capitulation to China. A hiding stroke neutralism would require Tokyo to end its alliance with the US and its opposition to China. Hedging is another relatively conciliatory possibility. John Hemmings has described it in the following way. He says, the basic assumption is that hedging means a state spreads its risk by pursuing two opposite policies towards another state. States carry out two contradictory policy directions simultaneously, balancing and engagement. A state prepares for the worst by balancing, maintaining a strong military, building up uh, alliances, while preparing for the best and engaging, building trade networks, increasing diplomatic links, and creating binding multilateral frameworks to soften up the relationship. In Southeast Asia, where I've just come from, it is often said that the regional states are hedging with China. They feel free to have strong economic relations and multilateral links with China, ASEAN, the East Asia Summit, and so on, but they also recognize the security risks from the North, and they turn to the United States for protection. India and Japan are in exactly the same position. China is their biggest trading partner, or one of their top partners, both, in addition, are members of regional organizations, such as ASEAN, where they engage Beijing in the company of others. But at the same time, they feel vulnerable in the security domain. India hedges primarily by its own internal balancing, its military power, including nuclear weapons, and Japan by its alliance with the United States. How effective are hiding and hedging? It strikes me that big powers, uh, such as India and Japan, 
I mean, the question has to be asked, can they truly hide? And it's one thing for small European powers in a classic balance of power era to hide from, say, Britain and Germany or Prussia at that time and France. It's another thing for uh, India and Japan to do so in the, at the present juncture. It's particularly hard to imagine when China and the Western powers could press India and Japan to choose sides. How to hide when two contending sides are pressing you to declare yourself one way or the other? Furthermore, given that India and Japan have territorial quarrels with China, is hiding from Beijing really possible? As China continues its more or less unstoppable rise, it will insist on settling these quarrels on its own terms. At that point, where will India and Japan hide? Either they capitulate to China, or they stand firm, alone, or with others. Similarly, while hedging is attractive, it's vulnerable. Fundamentally, a deepening engagement with China, especially economic, means that both could be drawn into its economic sphere. They would then be prone to manipulation and coercion by a mercantilist-minded Chinese leadership. Southeast Asia may have, in varying degrees, already have reached the point where hedging is becoming problematic. And when you go around Southeast Asia and, and meet Southeast Asians, as I do regularly, you can see that very clearly. Cambodia and Laos have largely thrown in their lot with China. The Philippines under Duterte is, of course, unpredictable at the best of times, but it seems to have moved a considerable distance uh, into a Chinese sphere, while it still retains, of course, links to the United States. Myanmar and Thailand could well turn. The gravitational pull of the Chinese economy shouldn't be underestimated, particularly if the US and Western powers continue their slide towards protectionism and falter economically in the decades ahead. Even the US under Trump is rethinking America's hedging strategy which consisted of economic engagement with China as well as strategic balancing against China. The desire to decouple from China economically, specifically on technology and high-tech in particular, is an expression of America's realization that hedging is not indefinitely sustainable. So the point is that you know, a strategy of hedging may seem attractive, but it's doubtful that in the long term uh, it can be sustained. One risks just being drawn into the sphere of a very powerful economic uh, orbit. Narendra Modi's hardening of India's China policy from 2014 to 2017 was driven by the fact that hedging, going back to 1988 when India normalized relations with China, had not softened Beijing on the crucial issue of the border or in terms of its strategic penetration of South Asia. So for three to four years, Mr. Modi insisted that he would look China straight in the eye and uh, sort of overturn the old policy of normalization on the argument that that hadn't worked. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, that's another indication of the kind of hedging of India going back to 88 that seemingly, uh, you know, came a cropper uh, by 2014. I come now to balancing. If bandwagoning is politically not feasible, and if hiding and hedging don't seem plausible strategically, what is left? Broadly, India and Japan could resort to some form of balancing against China. International relations scholars identified three major types of balancing, internal, external, and soft. Mm -hmm. Internal balancing, I think, is quite familiar to all of us. It's basically military balancing of an adversary by one's own means, hence internal. In the nuclear era, the primary instrument uh, is, of course, nuclear weapons, at least against a nuclear-armed rival or a formidable conventional power. External balancing is also familiar to us. It's basically alliance building. So you draw on the power of, uh, of, a, of a friend or potential ally to uh, counter someone that's more powerful than you. Soft balancing is what states do when they can't hard balance, either through internal or external balancing. Uh, this is the kind of work that Robert Pape and our own TV Paul at McGill uh, ha have uh, outlined. It consists of a combination of non-military activities designed to complicate a militarily superior adversary's decision making and to prevent or roll back their unilateral actions. It could involve public shaming of the adversary, 
procedural delaying and stalling in international institutions such as regional organizations or the UN or the IMF or the ADB, uh, turning to international legal remedies such as the Philippines did uh, when they went to, uh, uh, when they appealed uh, China's South China Sea claims. Uh, it can uh, relate to diplomatic demarches and so on. That's soft balancing. Uh, shoving hurdles and spokes in the wheels of, a, of an adversary without confronting them militarily. So what are the prospects of India and Japan being able, first of all, to internal balance through their own efforts? I won't bore you with all the figures uh, which I've ratched, uh, rack, uh, ratcheted up here in the paper uh, on the, the military balance. Uh, it'll take too long. But essentially, if you look at the figures on active military personnel, on strategic weaponry, Japan, of course, doesn't have nuclear weapons. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the three navies, uh, if you look also at uh, the, uh, combat aircraft, broadly the conclusion that comes uh, is the following. And I write, in sum, on a crude comparison, one can say that China has a three to one superiority of India in virtually every class, including the defense budget. I mean, there are some exceptions. And four to one or five to one over Japan in virtually every class. Of course, Japan has no nuclear weapons. In addition, in terms of overall national capabilities, India's nominal GDP is about one-fifth of China's. So there is little prospect of catching up with China uh, in, uh, in any time soon. Indeed, the gap is likely to grow. China's nominal, nominal GDP is 14 trillion. India's is 2.8. And Japan is at about 5 or 5.1. The US, by the way, is 20 trillion. So uh, this is nominal GDP, huh? This suggests that the defense effort for both India and Japan, if they want to close the gap militarily, will be enormous. Given their domestic challenges, that is India and Japan's, it is simply not viable to increase de defense allocations dramatically uh, over the next little while. This is admittedly a crude comparison of internal balance. All three countries have other security challenges. China has, as we know, more land neighbors than any other country in the world. It has uh, about 14 of them, and if you include sea neighbors, then it's even more. But it has four nuclear neighbors, uh, which is quite unique, and amongst the biggest conventionally uh, powered military neighbors in the world. India has two nuclear neighbors and two conventional military neighbors of strength. Japan is an island, but, but it must worry about three nuclear neighbors and three formidable conventional military neighbors in China, Russia, and, and North Korea. I mean, the short point being that you can rack up the numbers plainly and simply, but of course you've got to take into account that they have other strategic worries. Their forces are potentially divided, and so this may overstate Chinese superiority in short. Nevertheless, China is militarily a giant that would be difficult to hold if it should decide to attack the country. Of course, terrain, weather, fighting spirit, tactics, strategy, all these things count when we have military uh, experts here who will testify to that. But Chinese superiority, I think, cannot be avoided. India has nuclear weapons, which is the ultimate deterrent. In the case that a conventional war turns against it in the high Himalayas, it could threaten nuclear retaliation. Here, I simply note that exactly the argument that India uses against Pakistan, and I guess this morning we're waking up to that argument uh, tacitly, namely that India has escalation dominance over Pakistan, is also true for China over India. China has escalation dominance over India in every category of violence. Escalation dominance being understood as being able to trump the other side's potential to raise the ante of violence at every level. Any Indian nuclear retaliation, which is, a, which is plausible, could be more than trumped by China's response. I think this is something we simply have to face if we're talking about internal balancing. External balancing. If internal balancing is limited, it would seem India and Japan could opt for external balancing or alliance. Our figures show that India plus Japan is still overwhelmed by China except in respect of major naval combatants. Here India plus Japan, to my count, come out roughly even with China. 
A case could therefore be made for naval cooperation between India and Japan, which in fact is already happening, and I think the figures show why it is happening. India and Japan in alliance in the end, though, is not a sufficient balance. It's only when the US joins the alliance calculus that balancing truly occurs. This is obvious and we don't need any statistics to show that, but let's just note the following. The US and Japan are already in alliance. Uh, the uh, US and India are not, though military cooperation is increasing. The key point is that Japan already has an alliance partner that can help with its security. India adds little. India does not have a formal partner, but it does have a growing relationship with the US, in which case it doesn't need Japan. This is of course the case on a static analysis. On a dynamic analysis, India with its growing economy and population could be a balance against China. Indeed, going by its population size and demographic structure, it's got a huge uh, number of young people, it could pose a serious challenge to China's projected dominance. By 2050, I think we all know, India's population is projected to be 1.68 billion people. Whereas China will be stuck at about 1.34 billion, if stuck is the word. In 30 years from now, most of, especially all the young people will be around, there will be a population gap, if you can believe it, of 340 million people in India's favor. 30 years from now, in your middle age. Leaving aside the sustainability of India's rates of economic growth and the quality and resources of its population, uh, in terms of health, education, skills, per capita income, energy, food. I mean, these things qualify the quality of your population. This would be an enormous gap in population figures. India would be young with the number one population of the world. China would be aging and firmly number two. In other words, there is a case to be made for a latent external balancing partnership between India and Japan. This is particularly the case if the US continues to retrench and eventually removes itself from Asia altogether. An India-Japan strategic partnership 30 years from now would be a balance against China. What would this partnership amount to? It might eventually be an outright alliance or just an entente, a kind of close consultative relationship. But the key challenge is building Indian capacities so, so that it can, with 1.6 billion people, be a prosperous and stable power rivaling China. Building India's capacity is of course India's own responsibility. But Japan has a potential role. Tokyo played a key role in helping build China's capacities from the mid-1970s onwards and I think a lot of people forget this. Japan's economic interests but also its strategic interests in containing the Soviet Union uh, drove Japanese ODA and investments to China. In partnership with America, Japan helped the rise of China. After 2001, George W. Bush committed the U.S. to a similar role in building Indian power. As the U.S. goes into retrenchment, Japan could step up to fill the U.S. role. Having said that, it will take great patience and long-term vision for Tokyo to engage New Delhi, as India is notoriously difficult to to deal with, at least I think so. But if China is the big threat, there may be little choice for Japan. In the meantime, India and Japan can deepen their military cooperation. And I've got a paragraph here on, on a lot of things I think that Dhanuraj has already mentioned, so I'm just going to skip it. Uh, but there's, a, I think, probably a number of you know the dialogues, the military exercises, the uh, agreements uh, on um, uh, on things like uh, the uh, 2 plus 2 dialogues, uh, we've heard about the, the regular summitry, but I note a couple of things, I mean one in particular that struck my eye, um, and this is the agreement uh, whereby they would, uh, India would access the uh, Japanese naval base in Djibouti, I think people forget that the Japanese have a big base there, um, and uh, that uh, in return uh, the Japanese uh, maritime self-defense forces uh, would be able to use India's military installations on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and so on. So there's a whole slew of things that they're already doing. Uh, my only uh, added thought here, if it isn't already happening, I think greater intelligence cooperation, especially on China, would be a crucial investment and 
I think uh, Mr. Talyar Khan uh, will know much more about that. So I come to the last possibility, which is soft balancing. If internal balancing is not immediately viable, and if external balancing is only viable with the US or in the distant future, can India and Japan soft balance against China? Soft balancing, as I said, is non-military strategies designed to complicate and trip up a rival that has military superiority. It includes, as I said, public shaming, procedural delaying and stalling, turning to legal remedies, etc., etc. It can also involve creating new institutions and practices in the international system and building capacity in third uh, parties so, as, so that they can resist uh, a more powerful entities' uh, influences. India and Japan have already tried shaming tactics against China. New Delhi and Tokyo have insisted on freedom of the high seas as a rebuke to China. On China's BRI, they have both implicitly criticized Beijing. India has refused to go along with BRI, arguing that it, it is uh, a project that fundamentally is in China's national interest, as I think uh, S. Jai Shankar said, and not a cosmopolitan project for others' good. And Japan has suggested that its own connectivity is about quality infrastructure, implicitly saying that China's is about, well, shoddy infrastructure. New Delhi has drawn attention to the debt, debt burdens of BRI, uh, and as various projects have run into trouble in South and Southeast Asia, uh, people are beginning to sit up and take to notice. And we've had several visitors from uh, China at the Lee Kuan Yew School, and it's quite evident that they are beginning to get the message and are looking to rethink BRI under the sustained criticism of India and others. So here's a classic instance of a kind of shaming tactic that trips up a more powerful neighbor that is trying to extend its influence. India and Japan are members of an array of regional and multilateral institutions where they can check uh, Chinese power. And again, there's this whole alphabet soup of institutions, particularly in East Asia, that uh, you all know about. They're also members of the ADB. Japan is an observer at SARC and has supported SARC financially. Uh, in addition, they're both members of the G20, and they're aspirants to permanent membership of the UN Security Council. And in fact, have exchanged notes on how they can both take that forward at some point. Now, obviously, in all these arenas, India and Japan could work either alone or together to stall and trip out and oppose Chinese actions that uh, might hurt others. <laughs> India and Japan can also soft balance by creating and sustaining new institutions, particularly in Asia. Quite interesting that we think the West and now China are institution makers and norm creators. But in fact, during the Cold War, India and Japan were energe energetic agents of change and shapers of regional and world order. And I think this is a part of contemporary world history that we tend to lose sight of. India played a role in championing Afro-Asian solidarity, non-alignment, the new international economic order, most of you are too young to remember that, but uh, it was a, quite a serious effort. The Indian Ocean as a zone of peace, a variety of disarmament efforts, including the CTBT and NPT, and there was a, an original proponent of both those. Uh, the UN's Human Rights Charter, if you read the book by uh, Manu Bhagavan, you'll see how, how involved India was under Hansa Mehta and others in uh, advocating human rights as a in intrinsic part of the UN security of, of the UN Charter, of course, UN peacekeeping and India's role in uh, common but differentiated responsibilities in climate change. Regionally, New Delhi was a leading part of the Colombo Plan, and of course, things like BIMSTEC and the Indian Ocean region, Indian Ocean Rim Association. Japan too, uh, we think that Japan is a follower of the United States and hasn't shaped things, but in fact, that's not true. Japan, too, has contributed to international society over the years. The ADB is probably its greatest contribution. We forget that the original proponent, funder, and builder of connectivity in Southeast Asia was Japan, through the ADB and bilaterally, and now the Chinese have just run away with it in, in one of the biggest public relations coups of all time. APEC can be traced back to a Japanese proposal from 1966 to set up a Pacific Free Trade Agreement. Internationally, Japan was a key proponent of human security in the wake of the Cold War. 
In 1997, to deal with the Asian economic crisis, it proposed the Asian Monetary Fund, which was shut down by the Americans. Later, it was the force behind the Chiang Mai Initiative and played a key role in ASEAN Plus Three, China, South Korea, Japan, to look at economic uh, change and engagement with ASEAN. More recently, of course, it's advanced two key initiatives, the CPTTP, which is the Tokyo-led successor to the, the TT, uh, TPP. It's also stepped in to work with the Mekong River countries in the Japan Mekong Initiative, even as US interest in the lower Mekong Initiative has waned. So here's a very different picture of Japan and India as uh, countries that can come out with creative ideas and help shape the international environment. They could do so, presumably, uh, in ways that uh, would counter uh, China. India and Japan are attempting to create new forms of Asian strategic cooperation. And I think you're all aware of all the strategic triangles that they're involved in, India, Japan, US, India, Japan, Australia, India, Japan, South Korea. New Delhi is also keen on an India, Japan, Vietnam trilateral, which I think hasn't quite seen light of day. More importantly has been the idea of the free and open Indo-Pacific, which built on uh, Prime Minister Abe and Foreign Minister Taro Aso's ideas about the link between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Related to FOIP, F-O-I-P, is the Quad, of course. In the realm of connectivity, India and Japan have their own projects in Southeast Asia, and uh, as Dhanuraj mentioned, of course, the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor is the key initiative where India and Japan are working together. At the heart of all these endeavors is undoubtedly a common concern, to build resilience and ties between India and Japan, as well as third powers. The objective is not so much to directly contain and confront China as it is to strengthen the bargaining hand of both New Delhi and Tokyo in relation to Beijing and to complicate Beijing's strategic calculations. It's worth noting here that India and Japan have bilateral defense ties to Southeast Asian countries and again I think often we lose sight of just how many things are going on. India has defense cooperation with virtually every Southeast Asian country. These include training, arms sales, repair and maintenance of equipment, joint exercises, port calls, and even the use of uh, uh, Indian military facilities. I don't know how many people know about the very close ties between Singapore and India and the positioning of Singapore assets on Indian soil, perhaps the only foreign country we've ever allowed to station assets in recent memory. It's worth noting here that India and, J uh, and Japan is exploring the uh, the, the sale of military equipment to the region, participates in multilateral and regional naval exercises in the South China Sea, and is building maritime capacity in Southeast Asia. Japan's 2016 Vientiane uh, initiative of defense cooperation with ASEAN is quite significant. In themselves, the Indian and Japanese efforts aren't terribly consequential and material, but they are politically and psychologically significant for Beijing and for the regional states. Anyway, let me conclude. India and Japan have not been terribly close historically, but they've also not been enemies. Their relationship has gone through phases since 1945. For the second half of the Cold War, they were on opposite sides. With the rise of China, they face a regional threat as never before. Their strategic choices in dealing with that threat are to bandwagon, hide, hedge, or balance. In the long term, after mid-century, India could be in a position to stand with China and the US as one of the three greatest powers on Earth. Everything will depend on India getting its domestic governance right. But Japan could help build Indian economic and technological capacities as it helped China after 1972. India and Japan could come together militarily and diplomatically, but right now there is a limited agenda in front of them. A more active agenda is in the realm of soft balancing. Here, they've done quite a bit, unilaterally, bilaterally, and, and regionally. Finally, whatever India and Japan do, there's little they can do to prevent the Eurasian heartland from being dominated by China in league with Russia. So this is a bit more of a sobering last thought that I, I kind of plunged into right at the end of my thinking about this. But I thought I'd share it anyway. India is cut off from the great landmass of Eurasia by Pakistan and Afghanistan and the Himalayas.
Japan stands offshore to Eurasia. What they can do, though, is to build a coalition in Southeast Asia, as well as Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands, to counter Chinese power and influence in maritime Asia. Even this will require a concerted and creative effort. The past decade has showed that India and Japan have the incentive to come together. Slow and steady progress is the key. In a race, the tortoise can beat the hare. Thank you very much.